I'd like to welcome Garrett Ugray from Canada to come and speak to us. Just a little background on Garrett. Indigenous Canadian Garrett Ugray has worked over 12 seasons as an initial attack fire ranger based out of Ontario, Canada. He's travelled all over Canada in his time as fire ranger and initial attack incident commander gained experience with a broad range of fire suppression strategies throughout Canada's diverse landscapes from boggy swamps, open grasslands and the steep rocky mountains. He's also worked as a rural firefighter for Forest Protection Services in 2015-2016 where he helped action over a dozen rural firefighters, wildfires in New Zealand as a crew leader. He joined the Kiwi Task Force deployed to Tasmania in late January 2016. We completed back-to-back -back tours over five and a half weeks all over the west coast of Tasmania. Garrett will be speaking about his experiences in wildfire suppression, both in Canada and in New Zealand, and specifically addressing fire management suppression and prevention strategies in First Nation communities. I'd like to now invite Garrett to the stage. Check, check. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, kia ora. Um, everybody have a good night last night. I think I had an opportunity to meet many of you. Um, just want to say thank you to the UFBA for inviting me to speak here this morning. And uh, uh, it's something I've been looking forward to in the weeks and months leading up to this. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I was originally just planned to, to address the Franz delegates uh, yesterday morning at the Intercontinental, and then later I was invited to speak here. So it's just an honor to, to come here, and I've been really looking forward to meeting everybody and uh, getting a full dose of that uh, Kiwi hospitality. Um, you saw my brief interaction with Mike King yesterday morning here, kind of singled me out. Uh, that was great. He sort of opened the door to basically an entire weekend of cheeky comments all everywhere I go from everybody. Uh, that was awesome, uh, and I just want to say um, how important I think that uh, his discussion was. And in my presentation, I'm going to be sort of talking about developing trends in Canada, and maybe there's some parallels here that you guys can, can take some information from. And one of them is just uh, addressing mental health awareness and trying to bring it up and make people more comfortable talking about it and normalizing those discussions so that, you know, it's, it's okay to check in on your buddy, you know, how you do and that sort of thing. And I know that it, it's affected me, not personally, but I've sort of been the person that people come and talk to. And uh, I think that just talking about it is, is such a, a, a key thing. Um, so uh, I've really enjoyed like I said, meeting everybody and having these great conversations, um, hearing, hearing about your own stories and, and, and uh, your own background and about the, the Mori culture. And I'll be talking about sort of the indigenous Canadian culture as well. And uh, so uh, without further ado, let's have a look at this clip. This is Northwestern Ontario, a land of lakes and forests. Every spring and summer, these forests are threatened by fire. Forest fires are a natural force and are actually good for the overall health of this ecosystem. But when fires endanger property and even lives, they need to be controlled. The fire rangers of Northwestern Ontario are tasked with a critical job fighting forest wildfires. And when the province of Ontario faces an average of more than 1,000 forest fires every year, it's only a matter of time before these initial attack crews find themselves playing with fire. So that was a clip um, from a documentary series uh, that I was selected to, to, to star in uh, by the Aboriginal People's Television Network in Canada. It's a national network and they approached the uh, Ontario Fire Ranger program to, to, to film this show 
and uh, with a, to profile uh, First Nation firefighters in the fire program with the uh, sort of intent of, of targeting indigenous youth to, to increase numbers in the fire program because we're, we're trying to get numbers up and uh, we're, we're dealing with some challenges with that and I'll sort of talk about that later in my presentation. Uh, I had a lot of fun with the TV show, it was a great experience um, going all over Canada with the film crew, Fighting Fire was, was a lot of fun and it's provided me with a lot of opportunities including, including speaking here today. Um, <clears throat> so getting to my presentation, I'm going to try and focus on um, wildfire suppression uh, pre and prevention in First Nation communities. And this picture that I took up here on the left is up in a remote First Nation community called Mishkigugamang. It's in my fire response district. Um, in the 2011, we had a week straight of strong easterly winds blowing a fire towards a community. It was a, sort of an unprecedented weather event to have wind that long. And um, on this day, the wind shifted to give us an opportunity to burn off the fuel between the fire and the community. And so uh, I took a picture there. It's uh, one small section of a 12 kilometer long flame front that we lit up with aerial ignition and uh, with the intent of, of just eliminating the fuel between the fire and the community. And uh, it was just a truly awesome sight. The, the, the smoke column was the entire length of the horizon. And it was something that you really couldn't even take in fully. Um, and standing in that same position, I turned around and took the picture on the right, and um, that's sort of how we, we uh, are um, dealing with a lot of our firefighting in these remote communities, is um, values protection, setting up sprinklers, and, and sort of just evacuating and getting everybody out of the way. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that as we go on. <clears throat> a little preview of the presentation, what I'm going to be talking about here today. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit about my experiences. Uh, in Canada, uh, forest firefighting in Canada, rural firefighting in New Zealand and Tasmania, it's, it's basically the same thing. Um, number two, I'll be going over, uh, I'll be focusing in on these suppression and prevention strategies and uh, hopefully there's some parallels here that, that you guys can, can take from. Um, and then I'll be identifying the more salient uh, challenges and opportunities uh, in, in that, that we're seeing in Canada and, and, and trends moving forward. So firefighting in Canada, I did, um, I fought fire from 2006 to 2016 uh, in the summers, in the winters, in the Canadian winter, I was a, normally a university student. Um, I did five years as an initial attack incident commander, and that's really when I started to, to fall in love with the job. And um, you can see there, um, a picture in the middle, uh, myself on the nozzle, just a good demonstration of, of what we specialize in in Ontario. We have a lot of water sources. So we're doing a lot of, it's a pump and hose show, that's our bread and butter, that's what we're good at, that's what we're known for in Canada. Um, and the picture on the right, you can see there, it's just a picture of my, from my TV show, we're just sort of gathering bee footage, catching up on interviews and that sort of thing after a long fire tour. We kind of just want to get home and have some cold beers and a shower there, but time to kind of show time, you know. Um, so fighting fire in Canada, diverse terrain, diverse tactics for sure. I think uh, maybe some of the Franz delegates, uh, it's possible that you have been to Canada on deployments in British Columbia and, and, and Alberta uh, when we're really having a hard time. So most of Canada, uh, I'm listing off the provinces there, uh, lots of water sources. Um, as soon as you lift up off the ground in a helicopter, just lakes, streams, uh, rivers, swamps, everywhere you go. Uh, water is accessible and, and we're trained to, to set up the pumps and get it up, up to the fire's edge and, and put the, hot, uh, the wet stuff on the hot stuff. Um, that's what we specialize in Ontario. Uh, we also use uh, helicopters, bucketing and, and water bombers. Um, moving out to the west coast of Canada, um, Rocky Mountain Range, totally different landscape, um, steep terrain, um, not a lot of water sources, so we're seeing a lot of more uh, dry firefighting tactics, so hand tools, that sort of thing, uh, putting in a fire guard and, and burning off. Um, it was uh, the skills that I learned on the west coast in, in British Columbia and the Rocky Mountains, it, those are the skills that I used when I came here, um, so I'll talk about that. Um, so here's our bread and butter in Ontario. They're, the pump down there at the bottom of the screen is the Wajax Mark III. It's a good reliable pump. Uh, we're able to fix it pretty quickly. And uh, that's a pretty good pump setup right there. You can see the, the one and a half inch line hose coming off and uh, tied off with a gas can to a tree. So I took this picture. We were actually stopped to have lunch on a fire 
uh, while we were filming the show, and the, the sky kind of got clouded over, got really dark, and then it started to look like it was snowing. It was actually ash, so they were doing another ignition operation there. We went down to the lake to see if we could get a better view, and half the sky was sort of black, the other half broad daylight. It was a nice picture there. Um, in, in Ontario and much of Canada, um, it's so remote. We have got so much land to cover, and uh, there's, no, there's no roads in many of the places that we go, and uh, we are uh, getting there by helicopter. We are, uh, when we're doing initial attack by helicopter, we become hell attack crews, and uh, that's a typical hover exit right there. <clears throat> West Coast Canada, Rocky Mountain Range, a uh, good depiction of uh, the landscape out there, and you can see there's really no water there. You might have one stream, um, sort of in this gully here, but to get that water from there all the way up to here, that's just not going to happen with a pump and hose show. It's way too much work and effort. Uh, so you're looking at different strategies. Uh, another great depiction of there, just how vast the landscape is out in Canada and, and the kind of the scale we're working on. Um, I always loved going out to British Columbia on these tours. It was kind of a two-week paid vacation to hike through the mountains. Um, Great times. And so here you see in, in British Columbia, uh, they have access to, to forestry e equipment in the area, and, and we'll, we'll hire them on, and, and we'll put in dozer lines to, to create that fire guard, and we'll come in after with heavy equipment and uh, water tanks and working with limited water and basically garden hose. We're sort of doing mop-ups, so that's what we're doing here. Um, Yukon, another picture of the Rocky Mountain Range. Um, I've, I've been all over Canada, and I've had a, a lot of experiences that a lot of other firefighters haven't had. Uh, maybe just bad luck, but uh, I've dealt with uh, my first season uh, fire entrapment where there was a breakdown in communication and I ended up stuck in really thick bush with a really heavy hose pack on my back, on my back and, and I was kind of stuck and I was watching the, the flame front close in on me and uh, you kind of have that flight or f uh, fight response and uh, I definitely had it. Um, I was not f going anywhere. I was lucky that I just sort of made my way into a drop zone for a water bomber, so it was wet all around me. So basically when the fire came towards me, it just sort of stopped. And I just got lucky. That was a, a, a close call that I had. I, I learned a lot from it, just uh, communications, proper, communica proper communications. <clears throat> and I've also dealt with uh, the next summer being stranded on a fire. We had uh, rain in the morning, uh, Socus, and then it turned uh, to snow and the, the cloud ceiling dropped, aircraft were pulled off the fire, and we were basically stranded on this fire. My camp was several kilometers away on an island, <clears throat> and uh, inexperienced, not knowing what to do, slowly had, had hypothermia come over. Uh, we did get out, but uh, that, wasn't, that one was, uh, was not fun. Uh, in Canada as well, dealing with, uh, with bears, so I have had uh, bears repeatedly charge me, uh, predatory bears stalk me, um, I've had bears in camp uh, in front of my chainsaw, feet away, running it up full bore. Little crew members screaming, scared. Um, you know, I've, and I've had cougars stalk me in Northwest Territories, you know, stalk me and my crew member over a day, follow us around. Um, so I, I thought I sort of s saw everything that there was for fire. Um, coming to New Zealand and Tasmania, I learned that uh, that actually wasn't the case. <laughs> So um, I was a crew leader for Force Protection Services uh, for one New Zealand rural firefighting season from uh, November 2015 to April 2016. And I got really fortunate. It was an active fire season. I came here looking for, for action. I wanted, I wanted hard work. I wanted to see the country. I wanted to fight fire, and I, and I got that. I was on over a dozen fires throughout the North Island. It was a great way for me to travel and see the area and meet people. Um, I, and I was really lucky to, to go to Tasmania for, for that tour as well, over five and a half weeks. Uh, my first fire in New Zealand was uh, based out of Fariyama, and um, it was awesome. Um, I got to work with different indigenous uh, people from, there were Fijians, Tongans, Moris, and uh, working with them on this fire. You know, I was sort of the young, who is this young Canadian coming in here telling us what to do, telling us how to fight fire? You know, it, it, was, it was tough, there was challenges, and it was a contentious fire, and it was really hectic, and all sorts of things that I wasn't used to. The terrain, um, really steep, so radio communications were tough. Uh, I was known for basically driving around the fire in circles in my truck with my head cut off, so, you know, just sort of scrambling like a chicken. Um, but I learned a lot, and uh, I, I formed a lot of good relationships and friendships with those guys in that picture uh, still today. <clears throat> uh, Tasmania was a, a lifetime experience for me. I had the best time of my life there. Um, 
So I was deployed with a 43-person 40 Kiwi task force. And as a Canadian, to come to New Zealand and, and to work with, with the Kiwis here, and then to be deployed as like Team Kiwi to Tasmania, uh, I really got sucked into that national pride thing. And uh, I could see that, how proud the, the firefighters were to go there and represent New Zealand. And I kind of you know, was right in there with it. And it was awesome to, 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 to be a part of that. Uh, my first tour we did on the um, southwest corner here in the ancient Tarkin rainforest. Uh, we stayed at a lodge, right here's a picture from the lodge the first night that we got there. Uh, that's just outside, uh, um, outside of the, the dinner lounge, I guess, overlooking the lake. That's Petter Lake Wilderness Lodge, beautiful area. A dream tour as a firefighter. I'm used to uh, getting dropped into swamps, uh, up to my tits in loon shit, what we call, uh, basically or decaying organic matter that smells like uh, organic waste, basically. And that's sort of how I get dropped off in a fire. So to come to Tasmania and stay in this lodge and make it time, back in time uh, for tea, you know, very gentlemanly hours on the fire, very gentlemanly accommodations. I was having a great time. I, lo I loved it. Um, <clears throat> the fire was really hard, hard work as well. So a lot of uh, challenges in, in Tasmania here um, that I'm not used to seeing. Uh, you can see the black tiger snake, uh, the, the venom, with the, it's, I think it's the second most deadliest venomous snake in, in the world. So I saw those almost on a daily basis. And uh, the first thing that I did as soon as I got to the fire was try to go pick up a chainsaw bag. And as soon as I picked it up, lo and behold, black tiger snake right underneath, you know, as soon as I got onto the fire. Um, not used to that, everything, everything is trying to sting you and poison you. Um, just not, I'd rather deal with black bears, actually, you know, to be honest with you. It's just something I'm used to doing. Um, you got, you know, a wombat. Uh, so the thing about um, these, these, uh, these deployments with, with the Kiwi t Task Force there is they do, I think it's five or seven days of, of arduous firefighting, and then they have two days of R&R, rest and relaxation, built into the contract. And I thought it was great because I see a lot of uh, fatigue in, in Canadian fire rangers over these longer, harder summers, like this past summer that we had in British Columbia. Many of you went there. And um, when we start to get fatigue, we start to make mistakes and people get hurt. So I thought the R&R &R was a great idea. And uh, my first set of days off uh, in Tasmania, <clears throat> we left the fire. It was, uh, I was on a fire with several other crews. It was about 40 hectares in size and a lot of hard work and, uh, and not contained. So we still had a lot of the fire perimeter to wrap with hose and contain. Um, but we had our two days of R&R &R coming up, so we had to get pulled off. And uh, yeah, I sort of expressed my concerns about it, but there's nothing really we could do. Uh, and my first days off lined up with my birthday, actually. And it also lined up with the Hobart Cup in Hobart, Tasmania, so the race, horse racing series. And so there are some pictures from my birthday there. Um, get to know the locals there, uh, having a good time. Um, fast forward one day, going back to my fire, and uh, in the morning, we got there, it was about maybe 60 hectares that I put on some size, and we we're trying to work towards a really challenging target. They pulled off crews, working with limited resources, and uh, we had to strategically evacuate. We had to pull out. We had to go through our safety zone and get picked up, and that's a picture I took in the helicopter on our way back to camp. Um, it's 1,200 hectares there. So we lost that one and created some, some more work. Um, on my second tour, we went up to the northwest coast in Arthur River, and it was uh, a little more cruisy and uh, a little more mop-up orientated. And um, one thing I learned uh, on that tour is that if you send in crews from New South Wales to do a job and they can't get it done, you send the Kiwis in to actually go in and do it. And we had a great day that day. It was a good hard line and a lot of chainsaw work, a lot of um, arduous you know, hard work. There's no way around it. And uh, we did a great job, and we loved doing it. And that picture, you know, everyone's really happy just to, to do a good job. So uh, now I'm going to focus in on, on uh, wildfire suppression and prevention strategies in First Nation communities. And uh, I've got a lot of experience with that. And uh, I'd like to uh, actually just play a clip that will uh, hopefully demonstrate this for you guys. Going. You know, when you're cutting, it's like the hardest work we got. Upper body, back, lower body, strength, cardio. You need all that stuff. I just want to see more like, huh, like cutting, like. Okay, coach. Five, you are 
Headed to Oh, that's in the north. How yeah. far? From here, it's 370 kilometers. They're calling crews back, like from Savant and stuff. We're gonna pack up and head back. We popped a fire. Woohoo! This is gas yeah. on chainsaw training. Ready to go to a fire now. Oh. Up next on Playing With Fire. We're burning this out before the fire can do it. It's gonna get hot. Just a placeholder for a commercial break. <laughs> Garrett's crew has been called to move up to Big Trout Lake. There's a fire brewing, and more teams are needed near the action. But getting to some of these remote regions is half the challenge. We're gonna go for a little plane ride. The team drove from Sioux Lookout to Pickle Lake. From here, they are flying up to the northern community of KI, also known as Big Trout Lake. But their journey doesn't end here. They still have to haul up the gear by boat to the Fires Island location. Oh, I'm feeling pretty good and ready to go. We're gonna go down in the boat. We're going along the west side. We'll come down in here and find the fire's edge. The fire burnt up in through here. We're gonna go in and lay hose across, extinguish, and then do a return pass, come back and get a nice little garden. We don't really know what to, to expect right at this point. The winds were switching on us. The smoke was getting blown over the community. And then in the period of about two minutes, they did a, a 90 degree shift. All right, so you guys are good getting the pump set up here. I'm gonna run up with the part one, um, and then you guys can follow up once the pump's ready with uh, part two, and we'll start putting the line in. Hey, I'm already at the fire's edge, so uh, as soon as we get water going and a nozzle up here, I'm gonna walk it, and we'll start putting water on it. When we come, you must exit the island and get on that boat. Yeah, that's affirmative. Uh, Coon from uh, Goody, can you fire up the pump? Yes, roger that. Water's on the way. We gotta kind of dig in at least five or six feet on our first pass, so I'm just gonna cut off this whole area. If you could just nozzle that white ash, make it black, yeah. turn everything black. But uh, the sooner we get it done, the better because the fire's gonna be picking up. You look like you're reading a loud portable on 45. How's the smoke situation? It's sort of light and variable right now out of the east. Okay, thank you. The loud clear. I'll be on the one and throw you. I'm sorry. The side here is still a little bit smoky. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice. There we go. There we go. Keep pulling. Keep pulling. Awesome. Thanks for the hard work. Woo! Welcome to the fire.
It's only been a few hours since the sun set and the crew is heading back to the fire. And today, the plan is to fight fire with fire. Mm -hmm, nice. Fire's over there. So we're gonna walk up here. I'm gonna assess this area, and then we're gonna burn out in here. So we're burning this out uh, to burn up the fuel before the fire can do it. And we're doing it in a, in a controlled way with a plan. Let's do it. Hey, I'm going here. This fire is on a peninsula. So Garrett's crew is burning out the only trail the blaze has to the mainland. Oh. It's gonna get hot. Yeah. Here we go. Oh. Yeah! The hotter, the more it burns, the more it consumes, the better for us. I'm just sweating. <laughs> it's hot. You can see it pulling, pulling the air in off the lake, Ooh. eh? Yeah. The more it burns, the further back, every which direction, we need it all to burn. If we can get close enough, start throwing stuff in from the shore into it. What do you think, Ab? <laughs> I think you got it good. You yeah. got it too. Oh, really? Yeah, you got it worse. Oh no, I'll help you out. <laughs> Beauty. <laughs> Up next, I'm playing with fire. Woo. Hey, Ari, nice to meet you. Another commercial break here. <laughs> Despite the controlled burns executed by Garrett and his crew, the fire smolders onward, consuming acres of forest. I'm on the peninsula there with my crew. Uh, the peninsula is pretty pretty quiet. I'm gonna walk in along the, the shore along the bush line and I'm gonna try and get a map across the uh, flank of the fire. I'll uh, update you once I get back to my walk and take a look at uh, inside the burn there. Wow, oh, burned right into the swamp here. Garrett is doing a test burn to check the fire's rate of spread. Along the ground. The test burn tells Garrett the forest is very dry and extremely flammable.
The decision is made to do a full suppression on this fire so the local community won't have smoke for the next few months. It was right in front of the community. It was 100 hectares. We needed a few more crews to, to help with that. When a fire is within 16 kilometers of a reserve or town, it's treated extremely seriously and tackled head on. When the helicopters came in, uh, Harvey Bunting's crew came out, which was a pretty nice surprise. Hey, Harvey, nice to meet you. I uh, met Garrett Ugre back in 2006. He was on a different crew in his rookie year. Kevin. Kevin, nice, nice to meet you, Kevin. Kevin. Darian, my rookie. Darian? Hey, nice to meet you, Darian. He was a crew leader when I was a rookie, so he's uh, got at least eight years experience as a crew leader. He knows what he's doing, and he's, he's going to be safe about it. It was an, an island fire, but there was still a chance of it jumping over to other islands and burning into the mainland. It's, it was something that they had to take care of. With multiple crews on the fire, Garrett is promoted from crew leader to incident commander. Our tents were right here last night. When we have a fire with uh, with multiple resources or multiple crews assigned to it, uh, somebody's always got to be the boss, right? So on any given fire, there's one incident commander. So if, uh, if we have uh, a number of crews uh, respond to the same fire, one of them is selected to be the overall boss of the fire. Okay, I copy that. And do we have an ETA on those other crews, just out of curiosity? Check it up. I gotta talk to Mario about how many more crews are coming here because we're gonna be running out of state. Part of his job is to, to maintain that situational awareness and know what all the crews are doing and know how the progress is being made on the fire line and, and uh, he'll do that by getting out on the line and, and uh, on occasion doing an aerial recon and providing that eye in the sky and that radio communication with the crews to help direct them to the problem areas. You know, he certainly plays an active role in, in the overall management to make sure that you know, we've got the resources we need and they're being as effective as possible. The situation at Big Trout Lake appears to be under control, but fires are still burning and Sioux 18 is far from out. Fire, fire, fire. More crews will be arriving to help fight the blaze and protect these northern communities. The fire could be put out quickly, but a strong shift in wind could push this fire into a blazing, uncontrollable inferno. You just never know when you're playing with fire. We train all spring for this. We're waiting for that first fire. And for this one to be mine, 100 hectares, good crews, good times way up in Big Trout, uh, couldn't be happier. Fire season has officially started. So, a couple things I want to highlight from that clip. I uh, hope you guys sort of enjoyed that, probably better than me describing it and going over bullet points on a PowerPoint slide. So, um, some things that we have that, that weren't in the video were uh, in, in, in each of these remote First Nation communities, um, we have a community fire officer. Uh, that we hire on and train up to a certain standard, and they're sort of our liaison between the chief and council of the community, the elders, and, and, and the program. Um, and they're an integral part of fire response in these communities, and they sort of help us um, hire on people from the communities, because when we go there, we don't really have much for, we have our own fire suppression equipment, but we don't have any trucks. Uh, so we hire on community members with trucks, boats, UTVs, that sort of thing. Um, remote flying communities in far north present their own challenges. Um, it's a totally different world up there. Uh, for us, there's a long turnaround time on all resources. So to get up to Big Trout Lake, it took us two days before we actually got onto the fire from the time of dispatch. Um, so the long dispatch, long dispatch time, the fire has a lot of time to grow and do a lot before you even get there. Uh, there's longer daylight hours up in the north, so it doesn't really ever get dark. Uh, there was another slide from earlier in my presentation from the Yukon, and we were fighting fire 20, uh, 24 hours of daylight, uh, doing initial attack at midnight, which was pretty interesting. Um, uh, another challenge is hiring on of personnel from within the community, uh, including extra firefighters to, to help with the fire suppression. Um, and that has its own, own challenges, and there's a lot of uh, sort of underlying socioeconomic issues that I'll talk about a little bit later that, that we're trying to, to better understand. 
So I'm going to shift over to uh, prevention strategies in First Nation communities now. And uh, so what we're working on right now in Ontario, in, in the Ontario Fire Program, um, is developing community wildfire protection plans. And uh, so we're, there, we're currently developing them in, in mitigation strategies uh, and forest hazard mapping uh, tailored specifically for each community, where it is and, and, and what, it, uh, what it has in, in the community. So, um, and that kind of, kind of goes hand in hand with our community profile tool. And uh, so basically it's, it just captures First Nation communities using satellite imagery and still photos uh, for the purpose of emergency response. So up here you can see um, red arrows uh, just identifying what the building is and where it is in the community so we know what exactly we're looking at. Uh, and over here on the right, we've got our MVP legend, which is our uh, mobile values protection unit. And it's basically trailers of equipment set aside specifically for quick response to do values protection, set up sprinklers in communities so we can evacuate them, protect them, and wait for the fire to come through and, and you know, let our sprinklers do their job. Um, so you can see here on the right, each red dot is a sprinkler head with its corresponding coverage. And we try to ensure uh, continuous coverage around the community, right? And, and make sure that each building itself is, has coverage. Um, and you can see here as well, uh, these yellow lines is uh, one length of 100 foot hose, inch and a half lined, uh, providing the water to the sprinkler heads. And we, we also use uh, this, so this blue line is our, is our trunk line. When we're doing sprinklers, we're moving a lot of water. And we want to ensure good coverage. So we use a two and a half inch trunk line. Uh, and that sort of allows us to move the lake up to where we need it to go. It moves a lot of water. It's really good for doing that. I'm sure you guys know all about that. Um, so uh, that, th these are two new tools that are, are pretty good for us th to allow us to be able to respond in a timely fashion and to have a plan already in place for each community. If we're getting busy and uh, there's a more ex un inexperienced person behind the desk, which is what we're seeing now, um, they can just pull it up and they have a plan in place. You already know exactly how much equipment they need to get up to, to the community and they have an idea of how many crews they need to get there to work it. Um, so that's where we're, we're still working on that right now, but uh, seeing a lot of good progress. <clears throat> in, um, in the more urban indigenous communities that are road accessible and sort of just outside of a town or that sort of thing and you can drive to it, we're seeing uh, mo uh, fire response agreements and it just sort of formally lays out with the local fire department um, whose responsibilities are, 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 lays out the responsibilities so that there's no uh, miscommunication when we do get there. Uh, and we also have our Fire Smart program, which is basically just fuel reduction uh, in areas of interest. And uh, one thing that we're working on that is quite challenging is we're trying to develop capacity in these communities to give them and their own community members the, the, the skills to fight their own fire. That's what we're trying to move towards. So here's an example of the Fire Smart program, Wabasamong First Nation. Uh, they got spring grass fires every year, kids playing with matches. I played with matches growing up. I think I still do. Uh, it's, I think it's never going to stop. Um, it poses, it propo it poses a, a problem for us because it ties up our resources because we're constantly responding to these grass fires in these communities and other fires are, are kind of taken off while we're doing this. So um, here we had uh, 10 targets identified for the Fire Smart program with fuel treatment uh, completed on five structures. Grass and laddered fuels are removed. Uh, any firewood that we have in the process is made available to the elders, and that's an important part of sort of building that relationship with that community and, and, and moving forward together. And uh, it also provides a model for other community members to see and to follow. So there you can see a very, very uh, clear before and after picture of, of our Fire Smart program. And this sort of goes hand in hand with our prescribed uh, burn program that we're sort of seeing a revival in in Ontario. Um, so here's a little clip uh, I'll play from our prescribed burn program. Back me up there, Scotty. Today we're going to go on Lac Sewell, the Lac Sewell prescribed burn islands that we were cutting on last summer. We're going to go out in the fireboat, and my crew is the IA crew in case something happens, and we're going to burn those islands. I'm so excited. I've been waiting to do this for three years now. Everybody talks about the crews that have done this before. They say it's a pretty good, pretty good time. So. Over the last uh, 100 years, we've been fighting forest fires and putting fires out. Well, fire is a national part 
of the boreal forest. It's, it's the, the, the regenerator. Mother Nature has a way of cleaning up her mess as such, and that's what fire does. But what's happened is uh, we've interrupted the cycle, and by stopping in the cycle, we've allowed uh, intolerant species to flourish and then uh, become so prolific that they take over as such. My job in preparing the islands last summer was to cut trails through the islands and then try and clear cut them as much as possible to help them dry out and get some sun in there into the lower levels. What we wanted to do was we wanted to reintroduce fire onto the Laxul Islands and try and get the, the, the natural cycle re-established. We're going to be circling the island, uh, making sure no burning embers land outside of the perimeter where we want it to be burning. And uh, if it starts a fire outside the perimeter, we're going to have to put it out. So just another couple of minutes of rock music and trees burning after this point, but I think you get the picture. Uh, we're trying to eliminate um, older fuel in the forest because it, the, our forests are just getting old and sick and there's a lot of uh, fuel loading that's happening. And as well with these islands specifically, they're immediately adjacent to a First Nation community uh, that's used to seeing moose and caribou in the area, including those islands, but they've become so overgrown from all the forest firefighting that invasive species have come through and it's no longer conducive to like the native species habitat to, to see those moose come through. So there's, there's other stories as well. Um, it sort of leads me to uh, our new fire management strategy in Ontario that we've implemented a couple, a few years ago. And basically, a lot of the points were covered in that video. Uh, we've been fighting fire for so long and being pretty successful at it. Uh, the bush is getting old and it's not natural. And we're also seeing uh, climate change as well have, a, have a, an impact. We're seeing winter storms that are more severe, that they come and drop a lot of heavy, wet snow onto the limbs of the trees. So they're, 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 they're um, bearing a lot of weight. A little wind comes through, snaps them off in half. Well, that tree dies and that fuel stays there. And it's just more fuel to burn when a fire does, does come through. And we're seeing um, <clears throat> with these, um, these weather patterns that are becoming more unpredictable and more severe. Uh, our summers, we're, we're seeing more extreme fire behavior and, 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 and events. And a lot of the times when we get to these fires, we simply, we simply can't, can't fight them. And uh, so whenever we can, we let them burn to, to burn off all that old fuel and, and kind of regenerate the forest as part of the natural cycle. This fire is over 2,500 square miles in size. And when a fire is this big, sometimes you just have to let it burn. It took me uh, five takes to get that shot, me walking across away from the fire there with other crews watching. Um, yeah, but uh, that's a good uh, depiction of the scale of what we're looking at in Canada. And really, you know, you can have all the water bombers in the world, all the fire crews in the world, but in the grand scheme of things, you're just like a tiny little fly. And uh, Mother Nature has a way of sort of taking control. Um, so I'm going to start talking about uh, sort of in the same topic of, of prevention strategies. strategies. A, a big part of prevention strategies for us in Ontario and Canada is trying to develop more capacity in First Nation communities. And we're, we're having a really slow go at it, and it's pretty hard for us. Um, so we're trying to train community members to, to allow them to action fight their own fires, to give them that, that, that opportunity. Um, so a brief history here that I'm going to go over. Uh, I can't really talk about these challenges without sort of identifying the underlying root cause, uh, at least one of them, and it's a sort of a complicated situation. So uh, in Canada, we had a forced assimilation of their First Nation peoples uh, through the Canada residential school system. Uh, through law passed by Canada, working with the church, uh, children were taken from their homes and families and were put into residential schools. Uh, it was an attempt to assimilate us and uh, take away our culture and our language, and uh, then we would no longer be a burden on society. society. They wouldn't have to take care of us in our reserves in these remote communities. Um, there's a lot of intergenerational loss of language and traditions. Um, in these schools, a, a lot of uh, documented physical and sexual abuse. Um, thousands of children were, were actually never returned home. <clears throat> and they're still finding uh, unmarked burial sites uh, with, in graves filled with children to this day. 
so it's pretty unfortunate. Um, many families never saw their children again. Um, many survivors and communities are, are, are trying to heal. And part of that healing is sort of just a Canada acknowledging that it happened because we tried to sort of sweep it under the rug. And when I went to high school, you know, 16, 17 years ago, we never learned about this. It was never mentioned once. It was all just about glory, glory war stories of, you know, going down into the States and burning the White House down, which we did. Um, but uh, we're trying to sort of make amends, and Canada is trying to move forward and, and acknowledge that it happened. Uh, and that's, that's the first step, to just admit that, that there was a, an issue. So here's, here's sort of what it looks like. Um, so there you can sort of see the before and after. Uh, this is a picture of a child in his home community and then picked up and put into school. And uh, there's a, a popular book in Canada there, National Crime, the residential school system. So it ran for over 100 years from 1879 to 1986. And uh, my own mom went to a school. Um, it's on this next slide here. So she went up to a, here's all, uh, just a picture showing all the residential schools in Ontario and the time period that they existed. My mom went up to this one here, Poplar Hill, and she considered it uh, to be a good school. Uh, she was only um, physically hit when she was trying to speak her own language, so that was a good school. Um, it's important just to talk about this so that you guys understand. Um, when we're trying to work with these communities, um, you know, when I went up to my own home community of Bearskin Lake First Nation, really far up north, and um, I'm um, trying to work with my own second and third cousins to, to train them to be type 2 firefighters. So I'm a type 1 initial attack firefighter. We're trying to train them to be type 2 firefighters. And I'm trying to teach them basic firefighting skills, pump setups, chainsaw skills, that sort of thing to be safe. And when I'm working with them, I'm finding that I'm having to, to drive them to the local nursing station to get suboxone treatments. So that's like a drug to help people wean, wean off of uh, oxycodone and that sort of thing. And I, I knew it was bad up there. I knew that we, were, we had these issues, but I didn't know it was that bad. And I didn't know that it was going to affect work that much. So, um, so First Nations in Canada, specifically uh, the, these remote far north communities, because they're so isolated, struggle with uh, the highest rates of addiction, suicide and mental health issues, uh, sexual and physical abuse in the home, uh, crime, and the lowest levels of education and healthcare funding. Um, access to clean water is, is not guaranteed. It's really like going up to a, a different world, like a third world country up there. And uh, we're, we're, we're doing our best to try and address that. Um, some communities had addiction rates to opiates as high as 90%. Um, and I worked in a community with that. And uh, they were just, um, they just got funding for a treatment center in the community. And so their addiction rate had dropped down to about 60%. And uh, I was dealing with the same issues there. Um, and. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Mike King talked a lot about mental health and suicide, and I sort of caught some conversations last night about uh, sort of uh, unfortunate waves of suicides here in, in New Zealand and sort of coming to light, and we're, we're definitely seeing that in Canada. And we got suicide rates in these communities as much as 50 times the national average, which is basically the, the highest suicide rate in the world. Um, so you can see these challenges that we're trying to, we're forced to deal with when we're trying to, to work with them. And it's important to, um, not really understand uh, what you're doing, but uh, or, or you know, and what's going on. But uh, I had to ask myself why. Why is this happening? And uh, hopefully, by covering a little bit of that brief history, you know, I, I sort of you guys understand what why we're doing this in Canada and, and why we're we're having these challenges and trying to provide this, this capacity. And um, so, moving forward, um, what we're trying to do is. Uh, we're having to be creative and, and, and innovative with, with, with what we're doing. And we're, we're having to uh, form new partnerships with other organizations, really, um, that provide these social services and supports uh, for, these, for these youth and for these community members to ensure, help ensure their long-term success so that they're more likely to, to be able to be that firefighter, to, to have a job, that sort of thing. And when we're, when we're working with this, you know, it sort of reminds me of being lost when I get lost in the bush on a fire, all I have is my compass or the sun. And I've got a general direction of, of where I'm trying to go, and, and that's good to know. But um, when I'm walking through the bush, I'm going to come up to, to a lake that I have to navigate around. I'm going to come up to a river or a stream that, that I can't cross. Uh, out in BC, I might come up on a cliff face or a mountain range, you know. And uh, it's going to be hard, and I kind of have to figure it out as I go. Um, but as long as you're, you know your general direction where you're going, I think that's a good thing. And... Uh, if there's, there's one thing that um, you know, I'd like you guys to take uh, from my presentation here today, 
Uh, it's that um, a lot of these challenges that we're facing here in Canada that you, you might be seeing here in New Zealand, uh, it's, it's not that it's a problem or an issue that you have to deal with. It's, it's, it's an opportunity to, to create change for the positive. And so uh, in my native dialect, which is Oji Cree, um, Chimi Gwech. So great, thanks. Thank you for having me here today. You guys have been great. I've loved meeting you guys here last night and uh, hope to uh, meet more of you over lunch. So thank you. Thanks, Garrett. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Garrett. I'd like to call uh, Tom Thompson, DPRFO from Modenau Beach in uh, North Canterbury. Kia ora. Garrett, uh, firstly, apologies from Kevin Eharker, who was down to move the vote of thanks. Kevin's been called out. He's got a major fire back in his own area, so he, he sends his apologies. I think he's over sitting in his hotel room trying to work that through. Uh, look, I was really taken with your presentation today, how in so many ways we're the same and in, in, in so many ways we have uh, similar opportunities, similar problems to deal with. I, I was certainly taken with your animal stories. Um, we, we don't have snakes, we keep those over in Aussie. Uh, we do have ferrets and they're pretty nasty. Um, <laughs> bears, uh, we quite often have those around uh, after the fire gets put out. Um, <laughs> Uh, as, as Mike King pointed out last night, um, pretty cool dude. Um, you probably would have run across a few cougars last night, so... Um. <laughs> so I sort of hope you, you weren't too badly attacked there. Um, um, but uh, really, I think that the sobering um, point at the end with the indigenous problems that uh, you have over there, that was news to me. I, I wasn't aware of all that, so... Thank you for sharing those stories with us, and uh, we really appreciate you coming home. And the more of these interactions we have between countries, the better we all learn, and the better we're able to serve our community. So thank you, Garrett, for coming over, and we look forward to um, seeing you a little more before you head home. Thank you. <laughs>